I love bread pudding. I love bread pudding. I just thought about it. I don't know why. I was Can I hungry. say and gluten free bread pudding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Beauty is gluten free, dairy Beauty free. Is all the vegan bread pudding. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Beauty of a podcast presented by Ultra Beauty, where we talk to and with the pioneers who are helping us decide what beauty is and where it lives. I'm David Lopez, and I've had many titles in my career, celebrity hairstylist, creative director, beauty content creator, the list goes on. But today, I am your host. Uh, As a reminder, I always want to let you know that after you're listening or you're watching, this is a safe space that is a judgment-free zone where we honor curiosity and respect. Um, Low-key been like so (laughs) chill about the fact that this guest is here with us (laughs) because... A lot of who you are and um, my experience with you as a media person, like watching television, I am where I am today because of watching What Not to Wear. So I just want to preface that. Obviously, Stacey London is in the house. Hello, Welcome hello. to the beauty of... Thank you so much for having me. Oh my God, I'm already too excited for words. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just want to like set the tone for that. I think anyone that knows me knows that I have had always an inclination for beauty. I've just been, it's so much a part of my life. And I think my first exposure to the power of this industry and the power of feeling good came from shows like What Not to Wear. Um, I mean, and we were so pioneers in that you space. were You were truly the OGs, as we say, the pioneer of that space. I had, I knew culturally for me, the power of it because in our household we always cared about what you dressed how you presented Mm. uh, what you looked like how important it was to present yourself to the world and also even now when i look back at my experience of watching the show so much of your specific kind of advice always felt very comfortable it felt very um uh celebratory of the person i never felt like you were necessarily making anyone over you were just helping them feel good about themselves in a way that felt very true to them Mm -hmm. and i'm so excited to sit in front of you and talk with you about your journey and um how that's impacted people like me and also really kind of your journey since then i kind of want to open with something that i found really um striking and something that i think some people think about but some people don't you had a video on your instagram where you said you know who you are gets put into a box, you know? Stacey London gets kind of frozen in time and you're supposed to be Stacey London for the rest of time and you're supposed to be this person forever. And you say something about uh, your quote you have, your attachment to who you were instead of who you are is what is stopping you from being your best version of yourself. One, I just want to thank you so much for having me and for that beautiful introduction. It really means a lot to me to know that I... And, and what we did on What Not to Wear continues to have an effect on the people who are making, you know, really big cultural decisions and having huge cultural discussions about not just what beauty is, but what style is, what's personal to us, what's subjective, instead of when I was growing up, really, you know, I am a Gen Xer, I'm 53 years old, and I grew up with this idea, you know, that beauty meant one thing, Mm -hmm. it looked one way, and it was out of deep insecurity at, you know, when I was a, a teenager that I wanted to go into style. I wanted to go into fashion because it is an industry built on insecurity, right? Mm -hmm. We always think that fashion is cool because it's the next big thing. Do you have the coolest new sneakers? Do you have like the best new bag? And I truly believe even to this day that I am not a stylist. I am a self-esteemist. That is my job. My job is to make you see yourself differently. And the great thing about being able to do that on television is, you know, television is a visual medium. Mm -hmm. And for us to be able to say, that here's the before and here's the after not only had such striking impact because of the difference, but in the way that person felt, felt. talked, carried themselves was a remarkable transformation. And transformation, what is transformation? Mm. It's hope. Yeah. Right? Until like the second coming. Yeah. What we've got is transformation yeah. and evolution. And that is um really what the show wound up being for me. It also wound up being uh, a great lesson in empathy and compassion Mm, and what other people are going through. But also, when I would listen to the way that people, like the the way they would talk Talk to themselves, themselves, 
And I thought, oh my God, I do the same thing. No wonder I'm so good at being critical. Yeah. I beat myself up all the time. That show taught me if you have compassion for others and empathy for others, you must have by definition, yourself. have it for yourself. Yeah, one of the things that's the the biggest things I talk about on on all of the work that I do, and and you know, I was a celebrity hairstylist, and you know, I did all these things, and I thought to myself, like, what is it that I'm in the business of doing? And as much as you know, we do the articles for the magazines, what shampoo to buy, how to do this to your hair. I was like, I'm in the business of helping people feel good about themselves. Yes. When you develop a relationship with yourself that feels very intimate, that comes from a place of compassion and empathy the more empathy and compassion you have for others, inevitably. And if that means that it comes from like the way you dress or a certain makeup or the way how you do your hair, that is fine. Release, releasing the shame of the experience of beauty and self-expression through clothing and makeup and hair. Well, and it's interesting. What I would, I would add to that, that my capacity to be compassionate and empathetic with myself grew mm. because I was already exercising that muscle for others. Yeah. And all of a sudden it kind of dawned on me, if I'm if I'm doing right. this for other people, then by necessity I need to be able to exercise this muscle for myself. And it is sort of the same thing with clothes, right? Mm -hmm. This idea of look good, feel better, mm. like is true. It's like having a great hair day, right? Yeah. You've got a kick in your step. If you think that wearing oversized clothes that are dark color that go, you know, you don't like your butt, right? So you're wearing a sweater down to your knees. If you think that you're hiding, when I see you, the first thing I think is you hate yeah, your body. Yeah, yeah. Not that you're working with it, not that you're in flow with it, that you are doing everything to deny it. Mm. And that's what's apparent to me, that you feel ashamed, that yeah. you feel self-conscious. Yeah. That's not what you want to transmit to the world, right? Yeah. It, that's not that's not the translation you're looking for, generally speaking, yeah. right? I'm, I'm sure that some people may feel that way, but look at what the power of style and beauty can do to create the kind of armor that you the need armament. to face the yeah. world mm -hmm. when you don't feel your best. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's reflective of who you are when you are feeling your best. Yeah. So it's both reflection and protection, as yeah. I like to say, yeah. of who we are. But that, there's a big gap sometimes, right? What I love to say is, I don't care what you wear anymore. Wear whatever you want, okay? Yeah. <laughs> wear what makes you happy. I am not here to tell you the rules anymore. If you listen to them, you know that a belt defines your waist and a pointy <laughs> yeah, toe exactly. shoe. At this point, you right? know. Right? Makes your At leg this look point, longer. You know. the, the rules I learned from watching the show, I still use to this day. <laughs> exactly. If you don't know your neutrals and you don't know your yeah. secondary and tertiary colors, I can't help you yeah. anymore. But what I can say is that I want you to control the narrative mm -hmm. because that's how you mm -hmm. get what you want out of your life. Yeah. That is the thing you can do with style and beauty. You can choose the clothes you wear. You can choose what you put in your hair or yeah. what color it is or what makeup you want to wear. The thing is, you tell the story, you control the narrative. And I use the example of the suit, right? Mm -hmm. If you are applying for a corporate banking job, wear the pinstripe suit. Wear the suit that you know visually is going to register to the people you are trying to impress mm -hmm. or get to hire you, mm -hmm. right? But if you want to be a dominatrix, then you know wear a latex cat suit, <laughs> right? The idea is it's not just where you know where where what you want for the job that you want, you yeah. know dress for the job you want is something we used to say on what not to wear all the time. It's dress for, you know, the broadest and strongest expression of who you are for what you want. Right. Because environment is important. It is. And context is important. Yeah. And you are in control of your story. You are. I, I think there's something here that I wanted to touch on when we talk about things like controlling the narrative. Um, because if we can pivot, I know that after, you know, what not to wear, you've done all these things, but now... Uh, there's something that has come up um, when we talk about things like menopause. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, the first time I ever really heard about menopause is when I was watching an episode of Golden Girls, which is <laughs> hilarious. I just saw a meme that someone said the characters of Friends are the same age as – the characters of Friends today are the same age as the Golden Girls were. So I was reading about, uh, I was watching an episode of Golden Girls, and I remember this episode. It's called The Curse. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Rue McClanahan won an Emmy for this episode. And basically, it's when Rue McClanahan thinks she's pregnant. And it's not, she's not pregnant. She's actually going through the menopause. change. She's going through menopause. 
And she has a scene in her psychiatrist's office where she's a monologue about what it is to go through the change. And her first experience hearing about it, oh, poor Aunt Lynette's going through the change. And essentially, as I'm watching this, and I just rewatched it with our producer um, to refresh my memory about it, and all I could see, I mean, I watched that when I was a kid, and I'm watching it now, and I'm like, all I'm seeing is a, a, a woman, a cis woman in society who is going through this experience, who is feeling shame, who is unable to control her narrative, unable to control I can't control what is happening to my body. It is inevitable. It happens. The biological response means I can no longer have children, factually, scientifically. But the impact that it has on your life after going through it, it's like, how do you control that narrative? And your work that you're doing to control that narrative, because I know that even hearing people in my family going through menopause now who think, say things like, they don't, they're like, don't know who to talk to. They're like, who do I talk to about this? They kind of like hide it. Like they just keep the fan in the bag and they kind of fan themselves and put it away. And I'm just like, how does this translate into your experience as a cis woman or woman in this planet that's going through menopause? It has, it changes a lot for you. It changes almost everything. It changes everything. And Can you tell me more about yes, that? Yes, and I love that you brought up the Golden Girls because, <laughs> you know, one of the best memes I think that social media has provided us with as a as a civilization is um, Rue McClanahan on one side and J-Lo on the other. Yeah. This is 50, right? <laughs> yeah. And the, the fact is, and, and, and Paulina Porzakova mm. has been very vocal about aging and, and, and middle age and talking about the fact that she's somewhere between J-Lo and Betty White, right? Um. And we joke around about this, but the fact is, in my opinion, ageism is a very prevalent bias still in our society. And ageism truly, when we look at it, is much more sexism than we would like mm. to say. Mm-hmm. And that is not to say that um, – and I'm, I'm being very binary here when I'm yeah, talking about of gender. Course. Yes, um, of course. That men get away with everything. Yeah. But they certainly get a lot – away Mm -hmm. a lot uh, they get away with a lot more excuse me they get away with a lot more than um women at the same age yeah i mean i do not see george clooney hurting you know what i mean and there are a lot of actresses like sean young for example harrison ford got to do blade runner she did not not the second one Mm. right they actually projected her face onto a younger model uh, like a younger actor Mm. and i i couldn't believe it tom cruise Maverick, right? I don't see Kelly McGillis getting mm. back on board. And 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 again, I'm using media and entertainment as um, an example here because I think that's where ageism for women particularly gets visible. so difficult. And I'll be honest, around 47, when I started to really experience m- menopause, although that's, I had no idea that that's what it was, I was also grappling with the fact that I didn't have a new television show. I wasn't getting called to do television shows anymore. I was getting called every once in a while to guest host, do things like that, but no shows. Nobody was coming to me, right? Now, remember, I was a Pantene spokesperson. I was mm. a Woolite spokesperson. I was a Lee Jean spokesperson. I was a uh, Dr. Scholl spokesperson. I, at one point, was on like Access Hollywood, Today Show, What Not to Wear, Oprah, all at the same time. So, to watch my career go start basically um, from magazines to television at 32, I, I thought, oh, well, I've made it, right? I mean, once you get to this place, you just stay there. You stay. And here I was 15 years later, all of a sudden, not getting the same amount of calls, not getting the same amount of work. And I thought, huh, I don't feel good. I'm, I don't look the same. I don't feel the same. This kind of external rejection is really hurting me. I feel invalidated. Mm. And I don't think this is a unique experience. I don't think this was because I was on a television show and all of a sudden I wasn't. I don't think you have to be in media at all to feel this way. You felt, I, I've, used, I've heard you say the word invisible before. Invisible, but invisible even to myself. Mm. It wasn't like I... My entire core sense of identity was disintegrating before my eyes because physically I didn't look the same. I didn't feel the same. And I didn't know what to do. I had no agency over what was happening. And that is why I had to take on menopause because 
I had a terrible experience in menopause that started with this kind of decrease in my earning potential, mm. which is what happens to women in middle age. I think that, yes, there is a cultural invalidation that we need to change, but there is also hormonal chaos that we don't talk about. And so I didn't know what was happening to me. I was ready to throw myself off a bridge. I thought it was my spine surgery that caused anxiety and heart palpitations and night sweats. I thought it was that my dad got sick, that I was like experiencing similar symptoms to what he was experiencing, skin rashes and digestive problems and bloating and all of this weird stuff. I thought this is the physical manifestation of grief. And I've talked about those two um, experiences in my life as basically bookending my menopause experience. I thought what was I was experiencing was the result of those two experiences. Those experiences just amplified what right. was naturally happening Already to happening. my body. Right. And I thought I was embarrassed. I was dating somebody much younger at the time. I was afraid to say something because I thought that's going to make me seem unattractive and old. Mm. Clearly, I was not with the right person, if that's what I was thinking. But, <laughs> right. you know, there was a real crisis of confidence for me. Mm. And I truly believe that what we call the midlife crisis cliche, the trope, is actually something based very much in sociobiology. Mm. It is based in the idea that we are changing physically and emotionally, and yet we haven't been given tools to manage it. The same way what not to wear was never about the clothes. It was about what the clothes could do for you. Mm -hmm. I thought, what are we doing for menopause? There's nobody talking about menopause, or there were very few people, really, when I was going through this that I knew of talking about it. I didn't know what doctors to look for. And my physicians at the time said, yeah, it's menopause. You'll get through it. And they were so dismissive right. that I thought I was overreacting. Does it make you think then in that moment, it must make you feel like, well, then is my case extreme? Right. Is like, then then I'm having it worse than others because if everyone else is just getting through it because no one else is talking about it, that means that I'm having a unique experience for me. That means like I must be going through this alone. It makes you feel alone in that. Isolated beyond mm. recognition. And mm -hmm. if I could just say that in 2025, there will be 1 billion people in menopause. That is 12% of the Earth's population. You are not alone. If you are experiencing menopause, you are not alone. And the fact is, you should know about menopause in context, the same way we talk about all things in female physiology, mm -hmm. everything from the moment you get your period to puberty, to pregnancy, to infertility, to postpartum, menopause should be part of that context. Yeah. The reason that it isn't is because we think of it as an expiration date, right? We think, oh, you can't make babies anymore. Where your Goodbye. use value drops. Mm. Okay. Well, that would be true if we still had saber-toothed tigers and like woolly mammoths. But the fact is, point to a woman over 40 who hasn't contributed something great to society yeah. and, uh, you know, you're going to be hard-pressed. Yeah. Having children is not the only thing that people with female physiological, you know, organs and reproductive parts are meant to do. Mm. That is not uh, the only thing that we're here for. Mm. And yes, it is a wonderful, magnificent fact that we are, you know, sort of biologically constituted to be able to give birth. That is wonderful. But that shouldn't be what we're expected to do. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be that um, when that natural function comes to an end, because all natural processes do, that it's the same thing as death. Right mm. now, like back in the day, right, we didn't live long enough to talk about menopause. <laughs> you, you, maybe you got menopause and then you were dead. So yes. there was no, there was no passing down generational right. wisdom. Right. What we've managed to pass down is generational sort of uh, being generationally uninformed mm. or generational shame. Mm -hmm. And the less we talk about it, the scarier something becomes. Right. Hence the curse. Hence the you curse. You know, like from Golden Girl, like they called the curse. You exactly. Know, it's like, right. It is not a curse. It is actually an, an unbelievable blessing in so many mm. ways. And the funny thing is, you and I were just talking about this, right? Right now, today, whenever this airs, we can go back and say yeah. Mercury was in retrograde. Yeah, fully. I kind of feel like menopause is the Mercury in retrograde phase of life. Mm. And let me explain before everybody's like, Backwards oh my God, go she's bitching about menopause. I'm not, right? When we think about Mercury in retrograde, 
everything goes wrong. Everything mm. kind of malfunctions. Every there's miscommunication. There's a lot of like problems. Like all of our electronic devices go on the fritz. Whatever it is, that's what's happening at the surface, right? But what do they tell you about Mercury in retrograde? They tell you that it's a time to sit back, mm. to receive, mm -hmm. to pause to refocus, to center on yourself so that then your next move or pivot becomes clear. Yeah. And this is Mother Nature's biological failsafe. Menopause is Mother Nature's biological failsafe to make you do exactly that. Because we are not dying in our 60s. We are not retiring to Florida the minute, you know, we're 65 and our AARP discounts kick in. We're not. <laughs> we don't lead linear lives that way anymore. Yeah. So... Why are we thinking of menopause as just an ending? It is yeah. the ending of one natural process and the opening and excitement and transformation yeah. and evolution of another. It's interesting because, you know, we had another guest this morning and you were having a very kind of parallel conversation about, mm -hmm. you know, the revolution. We were talking about revolutions and we're talking about revolution also in the context of like it going in a circle. And I was reading about things that you've said and you're saying like something ending is really just a something for a new beginning to begin. Would you say that in a way the way you're speaking about menopause and you said, I don't want to bitch about menopause, which I, you know, is refreshing, I think, to hear. Would you say that there's a certain freedom oh, in menopause? No then? question. Now, I also don't want to sugarcoat menopause, right? Yeah, I, I don't sure. believe in toxic positivity when it comes to Ditto. a process yeah. that, like, we have to acknowledge that it is difficult. I, I say menopause is hard, but it isn't hopeless. Mm. And the more we talk about it, the less hopeless and opaque and scary it is. And the more we can... Look, if you know about an experience before you actually have it, it affects that experience, you. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It affects the way it is. So I went into this. My brain was doing mental gymnastics. I had no idea what was happening to me. I had no idea. But then once I understood, oh, this is what happens. This is the kind of a hormonal chaos. This is where hormones decrease. Oh, this is why my anxiety went through the roof. Or, oh, this is why I started getting cystic acne again. And, oh, this is why my hair got brittle. All of these things that may seem unrelated. That's the first thing. Yep. We have to educate. We have to educate. You need to know what is happening to you in order to have ownership over it, in order to control that narrative. Yeah. And really, so that we can give you the kinds of information and education you need to have tools in your arsenal the same way clothes are in your arsenal in terms of your personal style. Yeah. What are the things that you need to know in order to make the best life choices that you can have in menopause? Now, first thing I will say, the medical industry, there was a study done years ago that villainized menopause hormonal treatments, right, or mm. therapies. And frankly, that has just come out not to be true. Mm. There are a lot of women who could be on hormones who aren't because they were told it causes cancer, you'll get a stroke, you'll have a heart attack, all of the things. Now, the fact is, it is a much smaller part of the population that can't be on hormones for those reasons. But you have to have a very specific uh, health profile right. in order not to be eligible for hormones. So I always tell people, first talk to your doctor about hormones. That's the number one thing you need to do. And you need to be your own advocate. So if you are getting dismissive answers from your doctors, know that your general physicians, right, your GPs, have only had two hours of menopause training Ooh, in medical school. Two hours. Two hours. And one out of four is not comfortable discussing menopause with their clients, with their patients. So I want to be clear. I was a people pleaser when it came to the medical community. I went to my doctor and I was like, help me. I'm going crazy. Something is wrong. Yeah. She said, it's menopause. You'll get through it, right? Right. I thought I was overreacting. I, I, this is why so many people wind up white knuckling through things. Mm -hmm. If you don't feel right, I got some great advice the other day from a good friend, Dr. Jen Gunter, who wrote the Menopause Manifesto. We don't have a ton of time with our doctors. I realize that. So make a list. Start yes. tracking the Track things, things. That, that, that feel weird to you, your mood, Physically, are you in pain? Can you not sleep? What are the things? Are you hot? What are the things that mm -hmm. are bothering you, right? Take the top two most bothersome problems and start there. But make the list, the whole list, in terms of priority. Top two all the way down to the bottom. Because the fact is, you probably won't get to everything that's bothering you with your doctor. But if you can tackle those first two issues, you may see that they resolve a lot of others. Mm -hmm. So 
one of the things that I feel so strongly about is that there are so many different symptoms in menopause. Not everybody is going to experience the same ones. Not everybody is going to experience them for the same amount of time. Not everybody is going to experience them with the same amount of severity. So you need to understand the general umbrella right. under which menopausal issues or symptoms are going to occur and that they are related. Mm. So any one of these symptoms on its own, like anxiety, you could easily um, you know, just... Uh, Assigned to an, another reason, right? Yeah. You could easily think of another reason for it. It's easily dismissible. You could think heart palpitations. Oh my God, I'm really sick instead of it just being menopause. Okay. So it is important to get clarity around the issues and it is important to talk to your doctor about them. If you are not getting the answers that you want from your doctor, you have permission to change doctors. Yeah. You do not have to settle if you are not getting the kinds of answers that you really are looking for. And yeah. I highly recommend Electra Health's 21st Century Guide to Menopause. Mm. It is a great primer and a really mm. smart way to start. So I'm glad you brought that up because one of the concepts I was thinking about, right, is we're thinking about, first, I also just want to take a moment to acknowledge that you have multiple times said people that go through menopause. I think yes. it's very important to note the intersectionality of, of gender and biology. And so thank you for the respectful kind of tone of using people who go through menopause. And uh, what I was thinking about, the concept of kind of what do we do proactively as a society to sort of mitigate all of this, right? How do we talk to people before they get to the age that they might experience menopause? Where What does that look like? Is it like, can we get to a time where someone that goes through menopause isn't then having to go buy the book and look for someone to talk to? It's like, we already know what's coming. It's like, well, yeah. I mean, everyone's going to experience it differently, but- Sure, but, but we, you should know that it's coming. I didn't want to enter the menopause conversation with- my hands ringing. I know it's horrible. Aging is hard. Aging is not for the weak of heart. And people conflate menopause and aging. So right now I am talking about chronological menopause. When you come to mm. this between 40 and 60, not surgical menopause, yeah, not medical me menopause. Yeah. So chronological menopause generally happens. Um, and, the, and when I say menopause, I'm talking about the menopause experience, okay. which means pre, peri, and post. Okay. Menopause itself gets uh, very confused. It is an umbrella term, but the actual definition is the one year anniversary without a period. Really? Is, is your menopause day. That's the def the actual definition. And all of the symptoms that we associate with menopause are actually perimenopause when you have vasomotor symptoms. Okay. And then you said there's surgical. Surgical menopause is can happen at any age if you have a radical hysterectomy, um, which is taking out both the uterus and the ovaries, okay. an oophorectomy, which is taking out the ovaries, uh, if you have PCOS or endometriosis. All of these things can throw you into- so send at any age. At any age. We'll send the body into, into menopause. Into surgical menopause. Surgical yes, menopause, okay. Correct. So it's not simply about midlife. And then medical menopause is usually having to do with something like chemotherapy or radiation or uh, tamoxifen, which a lot of women take after breast cancer. Okay. Which uh, can, that's what medical menopause looks like, right? Yeah. And all of the products that I want to make or all of the products that I eventually want to sell, because I, I believe that this is so new an industry that we should be collaborating and not competing. There aren't enough companies like ours right. out there that um, we're fighting for, you know, the biggest market share. The biggest market <laughs> share isn't talking about menopause yet. We right. got to get there, right? <laughs> yeah. So, but I do believe that it is Gen X that is the last generation to experience this kind of generational shame that. I experienced, okay. but we will be the first generation to stop calling it the curse, that's for sure, yeah, yeah. and start looking at it as the blessing. And setting it as an example for the generations after you that will experience menopause, that when they reach that place in their life, yeah. it's no longer a curse. What I think is actually really interesting, and this goes back to what you just said to me, talking about people as opposed to mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. experiencing menopause, when I see the transparency the honesty with which millennials and Gen Zs have come into this world with the idea that we are breaking down systemic barriers around race, around gender, around sexuality. This is almost like age is sort of the last bastion of 
old world thinking mm. that we have to worry about. I'm not worried that when, you know, the oldest millennials are, are becoming perimenopausal right now. And I am not worried that when Gen Z gets to menopause, this is going to be an issue at all. Yeah. It will feel cease that. to exist yeah, I can as, feel an, that. as an issue. But I think the big, the big question right now is that when we think about menopause, I think part of the stigma has to do with the stigma of aging, particularly for women. The intersection between the two is is very, very important. I, I, I hate to bring up the episode again, but the she's in the office and, and the doctor asks Blanche, like, what does it mean? She's like, well, I'm no longer a woman. I'm no longer sexy. I know. And that, that's all I have to offer, That right? breaks my heart. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of this conversation is not about destigmatization anymore. I, I mean, I'm so far past that, right? Yeah. I, I, know, I know most people aren't, but I am. <laughs> and it's not just about normal normalizing this conversation with other people. This is about normalizing the experience of aging and all of the things that happen to our body. That makes life very difficult for a lot of reasons because they only recognize two symptoms of menopause, hot flashes and vaginal dryness. Now, interestingly, in andropause, for that is really the equivalent for men, there are two symptoms erectile dysfunction and hair loss. Okay, maybe a little mood swings, but I'm yeah. I'm going to I'm going to let that go for a second. The FDA approved Viagra in 6 months. Now, who do you think is on the FDA? Mm. Who is running that show? Yeah. It it's certainly um a lot of cisgender yeah. white men. Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem. I think that we don't have enough data and research, clinical research about specifically female physiology mm. and reproductive organs in order to be able to understand what we really need as we age. There is a lot of, um, you know, underlying bias. System. It's just so bizarre how things get stacked against us in yeah. a way that we accept as reality. Yeah. So a lot of things need to change. We need legislation to change. We need more clinical research. And we certainly need both culture and media to approach the idea of an older woman differently, right? Mm. If we look at the changes between the way we look at 50 with Blanche <laughs> and the way we look at 50 now, mm -hmm. right? I joke around, we walk among you. <laughs> Us menopausal women, we walk among you. You may right. you may just think we're hot. Yeah. But I also want to be careful that we don't get deluded with this idea, right? Which is the same way I felt about what not to wear. About really thinking that who we are is only based on the way that we look. Mm. I went from this philosophy of look good, feel better. You can't look good if you don't feel better. 100%. And it is essential to feel better in menopause. Menopause is scary because you do not know what's happening. It is literally like, what if you got pregnant and nobody told you what pregnancy was and you just watched your belly grow and something started moving around in your stomach? What was the biggest physical change you experienced that like shocked oh, you? Oh God, buddy. If you had to, if you had well, to like mean, pick one. I don't know. The, I know, if you want to share the intimate details. Listen, I'll share, I, I, there's a lot I'll the share. The safe space. Um, thank you, I appreciate that. But you know, look, the first things that I noticed were two things. Like dry, dry, and dry. Okay, really dry, like the Sahara. Right, my skin, my nether regions, you name it. In it general. was like I couldn't get enough water. The only thing that should be dry in menopause is a good martini. Okay, <laughs> let's just be clear. So we right. needed. I needed to figure that out right away. How do I moisturize? How do I? You know, what am I doing um, to keep my skin softer and supple? Obviously, you lose collagen, you lose elasticity. Right. These are things that happen naturally with aging. Mm -hmm. In menopause, those things get very severe very quickly. Cystic acne is a real issue Which in is, menopause. Would be. I can only imagine. You're going into your 50s and you all of a sudden you have cystic acne. I'm like, again? Are you kidding <laughs> right, me? Right, You know, and um, yes, like a lot of, but but for me, the two big ones were really the texture of my skin changed dramatically, almost overnight, and my mood. And it turns out that progesterone, the, the uh, hormone that is responsible, is the first one to decrease, is responsible for both skin and mood. Mm. And the reason so many things go haywire, both physically and emotionally, is because we have hormone receptors everywhere in our body. <laughs> everywhere. everywhere. So it is really important to understand everything from hair loss to dry scalp to dry skin to, um, uh, you know, I'm just going to say it, dry vaginas. Look, we talk about lymph... <laughs> 
it's all the time, so we should be able to talk about dry vaginas. Because <laughs> guess what? If one doesn't work, neither does the other. P.S. T. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so, you know, I think it's important to know that there are options for people. Like, we don't, we don't even have a consumer base that's educated enough to understand what their options are going to right. be. Painful sex is a really important topic to me because that really speaks to how are we talking about this intimately? Mm. How are we talking about intimacy as mm. we age? Why do we, we think... We don't talk about it. We don't talk about it. Yeah. And, and then we think, oh, it's so cute. Look at that old couple sitting on yeah. a bench holding hands. Everybody thinks it's cute to be old, but nobody wants to age. Yeah. Right? Why yeah. can't every aspect of every t- you know time in our life bring something new to the table? Yes. It would be naive to say that we only gain things. We have to say goodbye to things. But the whole point is you say goodbye in order to say hello. You yeah. say goodbye to something in order to make room for something else. You get rid of an old couch to get a new one. Yeah. Or maybe, I don't know, a chaise or whatever it is. Yeah. But this idea to being open that if you can let go, then you're able to receive mm-hmm. is something that I think is truly missed in the way that we talk about menopause. Mm. It, Of course, there is a grieving period. There is a grieving period because you are saying goodbye to your youth. You are saying goodbye to the way that you probably looked pretty much for the last 20 years. You are saying goodbye to the fact that you can no longer have children. And you can make space for that. It's okay to make space for that grief, right? Absolutely. Not only is it okay, it is really, it is so encouraged because, again, making space for grief allows you to expand and deepen and Grief also informs, you know, look, I experienced grief, deep, deep grief, losing my father. And I think it maybe even took the emphasis off the idea that I was not going to have biological children. I'm one of those people who never really felt like I wanted them. So for me, um, the grief of not being able to have children was just more that feeling of, huh, I used to be able to do that. Now my body can't, right? That, That was that. But losing my father... That was my reckoning with mortality. That was my reckoning with, I'm not a little kid anymore. I can't run to my dad when I have a problem. I have to be a grown-up now. I had to make space for that. And everybody said to me, you know, what is grief? Grief is love with nowhere to put it. Yeah. And, and actually, I don't even think that's entirely true. I think that grief, like love, are two of the only things in the world that can exist in two places at the same time. Mm. I can grieve and love my father and he doesn't have to be here. Mm. And I still know that wherever he is, he knows that I love and miss him terribly, right? I'm literally like, I'm just thinking about all the parallels in this human experience. And I think that there's something very, very telling about this experience you're sharing with us in that it's for many people something they will never experience. And but it's something that everybody will be impacted by. Exactly. Exactly. We think that because we don't experience it, it doesn't involve me and it doesn't impact me. But we talk to people every day, like so you said, we're amongst you mm-hmm. who are experiencing this very real biological mm-hmm. experience. Mm-hmm. And it's important for me to know because I have people I love and care about that if are I- experiencing this. I don't want them to feel shame around me. No, and also look. You need some understanding. That's when I when I talk about normalizing this conversation, I'm not like the about the destigmatization. I'm over that yeah. part. When I talk about normalizing it, I'm like, how are we talking to our kids? Yes. When we yes. have menopause. People, yes. Right? Exactly. How are we talking to our significant others? How are we talking to our friends? What are we asking for? What does support look like? What does a network of support look like? This is a, a phase and it has highs, lows, ups, downs, right? If you were um experiencing anything. We ask for help when we're at every other stage of hormonal health. We ask for information at every other stage. Why aren't we asking our friends and family for that same support around menopause? The more you know about it, you're not going to flip out, let's say, if your mom <laughs> like completely loses her mind in the supermarket because they don't have her favorite peanut butter. Sometimes it happens. I mean, honestly, I do this. I mean, you know, sometimes like, the rage is real. I'm not going to lie. And, right. Um, you know, right. so I just, I, I want there to be more communication between generations and more communication because as you said, I think this is truly important. There is no true human experience 
that can't be understood, mm. okay? Maybe not experienced by everybody, but can't be understood by another human. Mm. And it's one of the reasons that I get so frustrated when I see how divided we are as a country, right? There is nothing in true human experience that we can't understand in another if we just find the right way to communicate. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm like, are we all speaking the same language? It doesn't feel like it. When we it all really just want to be understood, like yes. we want to feel like we belong yes. and we want to be loved. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I really, you know, I think I, I, I'm very proud to be a Gen Xer. I, I, you know, we were sort of rebels without a cause when we were young. Everybody was like, what are these kids doing? <laughs> Um, but I really think, you know, there was an article that I was interviewed for a while ago that Forbes did called, you know, Gen X isn't taking aging lying down. Well, I don't know about that. I like to lie down quite a bit. <laughs> but I do know that we are we are definitely leading this charge yeah. uh, around, you know, the what what aging should look like, what it can look like. As a generation, we are probably healthier and wealthier than generations that preceded us at the same age, mm. right? But we also live in a society now where, you know, most 50-somethings don't look 50-something because we got filters and fillers and facelifts. We have and all, the tr all the things. We got all the things. And so I, I, it's a funny thing when we talk about the idea that Rue McClanahan and J-Lo were both 50, right? Yeah. And how... I mean, J-Lo is J-Lo. J-Lo is going to look like J-Lo <laughs> at 50, at 60, at 90. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But just this idea of the way that we perceive the age 50, right? I, I mean, there are some caveats to that. Like, I look at Justine Bateman mm. and what she's doing in her book, Face, was really incredible. Mm. She will not f with it. She will mm. not put a mm. needle in it. And she looks her age. Yeah. And then I see, you know, somebody the other day was joking around about, oh, a 20-year-old must have made this Instagram filter because it made you have wrinkles. And and all these middle-aged women were laughing and laughing because in this video, the woman is has the filter on and then sort of shakes her hair and it like comes off and she looks stunning. And I know her age, right? She's 51. And all these middle-aged women were commenting, isn't it hilarious? That filter must have been made by a 20-year-old. And I was like, are you guys delusional? Because that filter is what you would look like no, if we didn't all have Botox God. and filler and facelifts. Yeah. So, you know, there. I mean, we've come a, a lot farther, not just in, in – look look what we've learned in the last 10 years. Yeah. We know that walking 10,000 steps a day is going to, you know uh, – expand our lifespans, mm. right? Or extend our lifespans. We know that smoking is bad. We know that sitting is bad. We know that, you know, eating processed food is bad. We know that like there are so many things that we've learned with those tent poles of sleep hygiene, um, the way nutrition hygiene and exercise hygiene. Those are the tent poles, right? That are giving us these longer lifespans. If we are creating longer lifespans, then what are we doing with this time in the middle? It's not enough to say we're healthy yeah. or we're wealthy or we're wise. Yeah. Where is meaning? Where's purpose? Yeah. And I will be honest with you, I truly felt like my experience with menopause was a real identity crisis, mm. was that kind of cliche trope of a midlife crisis. I wanted to talk to this demographic. Yeah. I wanted to talk to these people who, look, I can only say from my personal experience, it is hard. It is hard to watch yourself age. It is hard to understand what is happening to your body. Um, another big thing for me wasn't was weight gain, yes, but weight gain has more to do with aging and loss of muscle than menopause. Mm. Menopause was really more about body weight redistribution. Mm. Like all of a sudden I had like a, a menopause shelf, mm. a tummy. Mm. I, I was like, what? I mean, I can put a drink on it. Great. But it's not, you know. <laughs> I don't want anybody to say, when are you expecting? Right. Isn't it funny? The minute you're, you're no longer fertile, you look pregnant. Yeah. I'm like, that doesn't work. <laughs> so, you know, there, there were things about the way my body was changing that also forced me to look at my style. What am I saying? I have had m multiple careers. I've written a bunch of books. I've done a lot of things in my life, right? Trying to enact this kind of change on such an entrenched level is, is going to be the work of my lifetime. Yeah. It really will take the most work. And if there's anything that I could encourage your listeners to do, it is to is to really go after the things that are much bigger than you. Mm. 
always, of course, everybody mm. wants to leave their dent in the universe. Yeah. But if you can find personal meaning or, or at least take your personal experience and translate that into something more universal, just like what you said you did with your career, that is so noble and so hard. Mm. But I mean, it, it's, there, there's nothing more important. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. And thank you for sharing the stories and being so open to have the conversation. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, speaking of meaning, yes. when we walked in the room, I showed you like there's different things from every guest that come in here. So if you're listening and you're not watching, please go to wherever you, this video is. Exactly, believe, wherever YouTube. this video lives. Go so you can see the set and see it's filled with all these beautiful, wonderful things. Beautiful, and wonderful um, things. kind of like my home, I'm a tchotchke. I'm a tchotchke person. We we are both tchotchke we, Yes, horse. I love yeah, it. I, I love, love it. it. Mm -hmm. So I believe that you have brought something to I did, but I don't us. know where it is. It's here, I oh. believe, and right here. So I'm going to, I don't know what it is. So I'm just going to. Aren't you going to open it? You're going to open it and then present it. Oh, I'm going to. Oh my goodness! Look at all of this. I mean, it's like. In the, oh wow! Someone wrapped it. Uh, yeah, someone wrapped it. Okay. I, I mean, I'm I'm so impressed because I didn't wrap it, <laughs> which makes me feel terrible. But I love paper and string, Same. and um, and I love gift wrapping. I am terrible at gift wrapping, but God, I wish I was good at it. <laughs> I feel like that is a real art form. It really is. Okay, I'm going to present these to you. Okay. Oh, I'm excited. Hold on. All right, I'm going to... Uh, they need to be standing. Oh, my God. What are these? So cute. They are from my collection of miniature dinosaurs. You have I a collection you, of miniature dinosaurs? I have a collection of dinosaurs of all sizes. Oh, my I God. I mean, that's so all right, cute. none that are life-size. Yeah, I was like, well, but, she's a collector. I know, right. But, no, I, ha I am obsessed with two things that I'm pretty known for being obsessed with uh, dinosaurs and Star Wars. And I really debated because, you know, Darth Vader is sort of like the Karl Lagerfeld of fashion. Right, of course. Of, of, of you know, yeah. sci-fi. And, and Karl Lagerfeld is sort of like the Darth Vader of fashion. But, <laughs> but I really thought about it and I was like, no, I feel like these Having many dinosaurs is just always a good thing. Always, always, always. And, and I'm a. I, I grew up. I'm a New York City girl. Yeah. I grew up with the Museum of Natural History, and every time they bring in a new dinosaur, a dinosaur, you know, fossil or 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 create an entire yeah. skeleton, I am like there. Yeah. I got to see the Titanosaur when my friend worked. Oh. oh. But I got to see it at night by myself. Oh my God, stop. It's like a real so night So that is like a true New York City experience. Oh. You could never. You could never. <gasps> and it is, it, 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 I'm astounded. I'm astounded that these beasts walk the earth. So am I. Honestly, so am I. I mean, it's like one of those things that I wish we could always go Obviously, if they were here with us today, things would be very different. Yeah, it would be a little weird, right? We'd either have them in zoos or cages or something, and who wants that? I think it, I think for a lot of children, it's one of the first sparks of curiosity of what came before you. I And the agree. idea that the world is very old, because yeah. it's the first introduction of like, what are dinosaurs? They were here when? Millions of years ago? So I, I, that's very, very sweet. Thank you. I love the symbolism of it, and I just love that you brought this. Obviously, it's a big part of you. Yeah, and, and also because I don't want anybody to call like, you know, older people dinosaurs anymore. <laughs> oh, okay. That's good. Full circle. I like we that. Can, we brought it back that's around. That's really good. Well, thank you again so much for being here and sharing this space with me. It really- Pleasure. Uh, it is so special to me. It's me. I remember I was texting like my family before. I was like, I mean, you really so much. I'm so excited. I was trying to be super low key about it. But I was like, definitely really, really excited to be able to meet you and, and spend this time with you in, in a very intimate way, in, in a way that I don't think I would have had the courage to ask these questions in a casual setting. So I'm just, whatever well, thank you, Ulta. universe sent us together, yes. Ulta put us together. Thank you, Ulta. Um, but also what was really affirming is in our conversation, a lot of the themes that kept coming up for me in my personal life and in other conversations are still resonating here in this space with us, which is very telling that, you know, you're someone that stays in the light and likes to Aww. operate in the light. So thank you again so much for sharing this space with us. As I said before, education is essential. Yeah. And it is so important for conversations like this to take place because if we are really trying to create menopause as its own vertical, not under beauty, not under just medicine, that it is its own vertical, that there's actually an entire way to improve the quality of your life during this phase, then one, we need people to be informed mm. about what's happening to them. And it is time to change that with our doctors, with our care practitioners, with our friends, and with our family. Yeah. And I really appreciate the opportunity that you've <laughs> given me just to be able to talk about it here. Yeah. Well, thank you again. And if anyone wants to find you, well, where... you can always find me on Instagram. 
Instagram yeah, because I'm course. an old lady and I don't care about TikTok. <laughs> um, on Instagram, I'm Stacy London Real. Thank you again, sincerely, from the bottom of my heart for sharing your space with us Thanks, and Christopher. sharing this space with me and being so open and willing to talk about the things that I wanted to know, but also things know, about we, your human experience. We I, went, we went, hope, we went through we, a lot of things. Good. I hope we got to everything. We got to a lot of things. Um, if there was something that you heard or listened or saw that really resonated with you that made you want to stay in the light, please let us know. Um, and thank you again for watching. I hope you're happy, well, and safe wherever you are. I'll see you all very, very soon. Bye-bye. Hi. -bye.